Make America Great Again. Den Wahlkampfslogan von Donald Trump gibt es mittlerweile in zig Verballhornungen. Dabei ist der Slogan weit mehr als ein geschickter PR-Spruch, sondern er spiegelt einen weit verbreiteten reaktionären Zeitgeist. Das zumindest sagt Mark Lilla, den ich ganz herzlich im Studio in Berlin begrüße. Er ist Professor für Ideengeschichte an der Columbia Universität in New York und schreibt neben seinen Büchern unter anderem für die New York Times, für Le Monde und für die NZZ. Seine Kritik an der Identitätspolitik der Demokraten, die er nach der Wahl von Donald Trump erhob, sorgte auch bei uns für hitzige Debatten. Herzlich willkommen, Herr Lila. Good to be here. Ja, Herr Lila, Sie sagen, es weht ein reaktionärer Geist. Ich nehme an, das sind keine guten Nachrichten. No, it's very bad news, um, because um, you know the nature of, of reaction is to um, think that you're, you've lived after some break in history and you're dying to get back. And what happens, as with revolutionaries are too focused on the future, reactionaries are too focused on the past, and in this period, uh, attention is not being focused on our present and trying to understand um, all the complications of the way we live now and our political problems, especially with the global economy and the rest. So there's a kind of flight from intellectual responsibility, I feel. Mm -hmm. Ich möchte gerne besser verstehen, was dieser reaktionäre Zeitgeist denn ist. Die sagen, es gibt verschiedene Beispiele im Moment für reaktionäre Ideen. Wir finden die zum Beispiel beim Front National, aber auch beim Islamischen Staat. Mm. Das sind ja sehr unterschiedliche, mm. sagen wir mal, Denkrichtungen erstmal. Was verbindet denn reaktionäre Denkstile? Well, what they share is um, uh, a conception of history. To begin with, they think about politics in terms of history, not in terms of human nature, let's say. And they have a picture of history that um, there was a period in which things ran along in a healthy, uh, in a healthy way, and then there was a break. There was a moment where everything fell apart. And whatever has ha happened after that um, is a was a result of what happened there. So for the National Front, um, th the problems um, begin in the story they now tell uh, with uh, immigration. Immigration and the Cultural Revolution of the 60s has led to a has led to crime, has led to problems in the schools and all the rest. And so that kind of break uh, through the 60s and 70s um, has created all these problems that require us to look back to the world that existed before that break. The Islamic case is rather similar. The Islamists, as opposed to serious Islamic, uh, Islamic scholars, think that in the 19th century, that um, there had uh, that a, a, a continuous Islamic tradition um, had been broken by modernization, colonialism, and also just by the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. that countries began wanting to um, develop, uh, modern science was brought, and all the rest. So all the contemporary problems in Muslim societies for the Islamists go back to the fact that there was a, um, a departure from Sharia law and the West moved in. Jetzt sagen Sie eigentlich schon sehr klar, es geht darum, dass man nicht eine Entwicklung der Geschichte sieht, sondern dass es um diesen Bruch geht. Im Moment ist gerade okay. Ihr Buch neu auf dem Markt, Der Glanz der Vergangenheit. Da geht es um diesen reaktionären Zeitgeist, erschienen im NZZ Verlag. Und da sagen sie auch, oft täuschen wir uns darüber, was der Reaktionäre eigentlich ist. Wir meinen nämlich, das sei die cholerische Variante des Konservativen. Aber das habe gar nichts zu tun mit konservativ sein. Das müssen Sie mir erklären. Ja, yeah, I think you need to keep two pairs in mind. So, think of conservatives and liberals, or what we call liberals in the United States, would be something like social democrats here. Uh, um, what divides them is they have different pictures of human nature and the relation of individuals to society. Conservatives see society as something that develops continually over time. We as individuals are actually products of our society, sort of instances of our so societies rather than free individuals. And that healthy social change comes when you pass on the traditions um, to these individuals. And if there are going to be changes, that they be continuous and slow. Liberals begin with the individual. 
and the individual as a carrier of rights. They then conceive of society as the product of a contract among people who have come together for that reason. Um, neither of them uh, imply any kind of historical catastrophe or anything like that. They're two rival pictures of what we are as human beings individually and collectively. The revolutionary and the romantic and, and the reactionary, both of these things really developed in the 19th century and they developed together. And what they share, what the revolutionary and the reactionary share is this sense of history that I was just describing that there was a break or that there's going to be a break. Mm -hmm. So for a, rev a revolutionary has this faith that a certain kind of political activity will lead to a break after which everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. Or if the revolution's already happened, then uh, that revolution needs to be continued and those who aren't with it have to be uh, delivered from it. Und, und genau da kommt ja dieser Wahlspruch von Donald Trump rein, make America great right. again. Also, right. Es war mal groß und jetzt geht es darum, sozusagen endlich das Rad rumzureißen, also nicht etwas zu bewahren, was konservativ wäre, sondern eben reaktionär zurückzugehen. Mir fiel dann ein, dass ja eigentlich dieser Wahlspruch gar nicht alt ist, äh, gar nicht neu ist, yeah, no, <laughs> sondern... It, it was Reagan's, yeah. Genau, was let's make Trump's. America great, uh, great again, bei um, Reagan in den yeah. neun, also 1980. Yeah. Warum hat er diesen Wahlspruch wiedergenommen? Oder er sagt ja, er hätte ihn gar nicht wiedergenommen, er hätte ihn erfunden. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, no, it's interesting you, you, you bring this up. It's not very well known outside the United States that that's the case. And uh, they meant it in different ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Reagan's message was hopeful. Um, Americans are addicted to hope, and um, you need somehow to give them a hopeful vision of their future. And what Reagan meant, I think, is not that we had to return to things as they were in the past, but if we get things right, we're going to be as great as we were in the past. It's not that, but we don't need to return to things. With Trump, it's a return. It's a question of undoing all of this damage that's been done. Because what goes along with reactionary thought is not just that there's been a break, but that it requires some apocalypse to set things right again. You know, that Heidegger said, only a god can save us now. Mm -hmm. And the, the reactionary believes only an apocalypse can save us now. And when you talk, even to intelligent, educated Trump voters, they will often all say the same thing, which is that we voted because we wanted to break things up. That's a, an apocalyptic mentality mm -hmm. that comes out mm -hmm. of reaction. Mm -hmm. Was irgendwie auch zeigt, dass die Enttäuschung so groß ist. Und mir fiel da noch ein anderes Buch ein, als ich Ihr Buch gelesen habe, nämlich Sigmund Baumann, der große Soziologe, der leider ja verstorben ist. Sein letztes Buch hieß ja Retro, Retro, kann ich sagen? Retrotopia. Retropia, genau. Und es ist eine, eine Idee, eigentlich Thomas Morus Idee von Utopia, 500 Jahre später ins Gegenteil zu verkehren und zu sagen, na ja, der hatte noch diese Idee, wir können irgendwann die Utopie, mm. wir können das goldene Zeitalter noch einmal wiedererlangen, mm. währenddessen heute eigentlich wirklich diese politische Nostalgie ganz groß ist. Alles muss zusammenbrechen, alles ist am Ende. Mm. Und er sagt ganz deutlich, die Leute sind einfach enttäuscht. Der Nationalstaat hat mm. nicht diese Sicherheit und diesen Wohlstand gebracht, den man ihnen versprochen hat. Mm. Und genau so war doch ein Stück weit auch die Analyse jetzt nach der Wahl von Donald Trump. Ja, yeah, ja, yeah, exactly. But, but what's interesting about, um, about uh, uh, sort of uh, um, disappointment, which you just mentioned, mm -hmm. is that revolutionary hopes can always be disappointed. So you have a revolution, you expect things to change. Nostalgia is irrefutable, because what you can what you can do is say that the reason things aren't working is not that uh, we haven't had the revolution; it's that we haven't gone back far enough. And so people keep an idea of the past because they feel the past has already happened, where revolutionaries have a fantasy of the future. And so it's much easier to peddle, to sell political nostalgia than it is future political utopianism, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. Sie haben vorhin verglichen, was eigentlich der islamische Staat und Front National vielleicht gemeinsam haben könnten. Sie legen auch eine 
sehr interessante Deutung vor der Terroranschläge in Paris von 2015, wo Sie eigentlich sagen, auch da sieht man in der Art und Weise, wie nachher gesprochen wurde und was die Motive auch waren, mit diesem Ereignis nachher umzugehen und es auch politisch zu instrumentalisieren, wie mit eben politischer Nostalgie äh, umgegangen wird. Die einen denken nämlich, sie hätten so etwas verloren wie den Gottesstaat, die muslimische wunderbare Übermacht. Mhm. Und die anderen denken, wir sehen jetzt wirklich, dass Frankreich am Ende ist. Frankreich hat eigentlich alles verloren, was es jemals war. Ja, yeah, I, I, was, I was living there when it happened and I saw both those things uh, develop, uh, one after another. And um, strangely, um, one of the books that had uh, the biggest effect uh, in, in expressing mm -hmm. and catalyzing This French nostalgia was the uh, uh, Soumission, the, the mm -hmm. novel von Welbeck. of Welbeck. And it was published on the day of the Charlie Hebdo mm -hmm. bombing. And from that day, um, both of these things developed in parallel. The more we understood about the, the motives of the killers, which were very nostalgic, uh, without, much, without many education, the more we understood about that, the more a certain French reactionary right developed um, trying to explain how we got that in France. So for me, this parallel development was just fascinating. Mm -hmm. Ja, das verstehe ich ähm, sehr gut. Vielleicht, wenn wir noch einmal zurückgehen zu dieser Idee, dass es diese Brüche ähm, nicht geben kann oder dass die Sehnsucht nach dem Bruch, nach der Apokalypse, mm -hmm. ähm, Sie sagen, fehlgeleitet ist. Das bringt uns als Politik nicht voran. Da fiel mir dann doch ähm, der Fall der Mauer ein. War hm. das nicht ein Bruch in der Geschichte, wo wir sagen müssen, das war doch eigentlich ein positiver Bruch? Also gibt es nicht Brüche, von denen wir sagen müssen, die sind jetzt nicht unbedingt negativ zu bewerten? Sure, I mean, um, it, it's always easy to raise expectations in our, in our personal lives, uh, not only in politics, and then we're, we get married and we're disappointed, we have kids and we get disappointed, right? Uh, but something else is going on once you view history in this way. Then uh, the drama seems, seems not only more dramatic, but you actually have no tools to affect it. Whereas if, uh, you know, a marriage turns out not to be ideal, you can go to therapy or work on your marriage or whatever. But what do you do if you are living in the 21st century and there was this break in Islamic history centuries ago? There's very little you can do practically. And so you're willing to think about radical things and then you maybe, um, you know, c commit to these things and still things don't change. You get into a cycle of disappointment and radicalization, which is what we see in political Islamism now. Mm -hmm. Wenn wir die Politik in den USA im Moment analysieren, dann kommt man sozusagen auch bei uns nicht an Ihnen vorbei. Mm. Und nämlich an einem bestimmten Text, der auch bei uns sehr, sehr viel zu reden gab, nämlich ein Gastkommentar in der New York Times, wo sie gesagt haben, eigentlich sind die US-Demokraten dafür verantwortlich zu machen, dass Trump gewonnen hat, und zwar deswegen, weil sie es zu weit getrieben haben mit der sogenannten Identitätspolitik, also mit dem Schutz und der Beförderung quasi von Minderheitenrechten. Das hat ihnen ziemlich viel Ärger eingebracht, oder? Yes. yes. I became a meme on, on the Internet, yes. Verstehen Sie das? Um, Well, I certainly meant to bring attention to this. Part of the misunderstanding is that the subtitle of the piece saying that this is why um, Hillary Clinton lost was not in my article. But rather, identity politics um, was res uh, partially responsible for uh, 30 years of democratic politics that were focused not on the nation and what we share together and a common project in order, for example, to fight Reaganism, but rather on the demands and the concerns and sensitivities of particular groups. Those sensitivities and those worries are genuine, but by focusing on small groups and not on the nation and not having a sense of the nation as um, sharing a destiny, mm -hmm. Um, it, it took uh, the eyes off of the importance of institutional politics in the United States and not just movement politics. 
And so it's not just that mentioning identity politics made people vote for Trump. It wasn't that. It's that identity politics got Democrats and liberals in general out of the business, uh, out of the vision business, mm -hmm. if you like. And instead, they saw these groups as always having competing demands. Eigentlich könnte man sagen, der Vorwurf lautet, sie haben keine Politik mehr gemacht für eine Gemeinschaft, sondern so eine Art Klientelpolitik. Yes. <laughs> and, and it wasn't just that these are little groups, these little clientels uh, with particular political demands, but what, ch what, what changed as well, as I try to describe in the book, is that there was a movement from identity politics understood as the, the institutional politics of these client groups to an, an identity politics that's about the identity of the individual, that it became a politics of meaning. It's about me, my identity, how I define myself. And I want to be recognized by the rest of society. And I'm only engaged in politics uh, regarding things that affect how I understand myself as an individual, which makes it very hard to get people engaged with each other for a common project. Sie sagen ja auch, das ist eine Politik des Narzissmus und erwähnen immer wieder, wie wichtig Ihnen eigentlich der Ausspruch ist. Ich glaube, das ist in der Antrittsrede von John F. Kennedy, als er gesagt hat, wir müssen wieder darüber nachdenken, nicht nur, was kann der Staat mir geben, sondern was kann ich dem Staat geben. Das heißt, irgendetwas stört Sie daran, dass die Leute irgendwie primär mit sich beschäftigt sind. Yeah, yeah, and a part of it is this sense that there is no we in the country, but there are just various groups. And that when we talk about we, it's a cover for talking about just white people, say. So on American campuses, for example, the way you pronounce the word we is we, <laughs> ironically, as if no such thing exists. And what that means is that when people outside of liberal circles are suffering and they're looking for the nation to come together to help them, only the Republicans have offered a vision. It's a terrible vision. We find that the Reagan vision did not deliver what it promised, mm -hmm. but at least was a vision of the country that inspired people. While Democrats are there criticizing white people for what they've done to black people and all the rest, which is important in education and film and civil society, we're going through a reckoning with our history. But politics is politics. You have to go out and convince people, unlike yourself, to join you in a common project. But this narcissism is so deep, especially among the young, they are incapable of talking to people in middle America. And moreover, they don't even care to. They have contempt for them, which is no way to win power in politics. Mm -hmm. Ich möchte über alle diese Dinge mit Ihnen sprechen. Sie haben diesen Artikel ja auch ausgebaut zu einem Buch, The Once and Future Liberal, wo Sie diese These noch einmal aufnehmen und, und vertiefen. Bevor wir noch einmal tiefer da einsteigen, möchte ich jemanden zu Wort kommen lassen, der das anders sieht. Und der sagt, Moment mal, Identitätspolitik ist enorm wichtig für uns. Und zwar ist das Andrew Solomon, ein Journalist mm. und Psychologe, yeah. der in einem TED-Talk über dieses Thema gesprochen hat. It took identity to rescue me from sadness. The gay rights movement posits a world in which my appearances are a victory. Identity politics always works on two fronts, to give pride to people who have a given condition or characteristic, and to cause the outside world to treat such people more gently and more kindly. Those are two totally separate enterprises, but progress in each sphere reverberates in the other. Identity politics can be narcissistic. People extol a difference only because it's theirs. People narrow the world and function in discrete groups without empathy for one another. But properly understood and wisely practiced, identity politics should expand our idea of what it is to be human. Andrew Solomon sagt hier mm. sehr deutlich, dass Identity Politics oder Identitätspolitik sehr viel mit Menschlichkeit zu tun mm -hmm. hat. Was entgegnen Sie? No, I've never seen this and it looks a little like a response to my book. That's very interesting. <laughs> well, I, I think the way to explain it is that America is undergoing two revolutions simultaneously. One is a political revolution that's coming from the right and from below and that's populist. There's another revolution going on that's a cultural revolution. And that revolution is about all the things that Andrew Sullivan just talked about, um, Solomon just spoke about. And that is 
that people need recognition and acceptance in society. Um, the changes in my lifetime regarding these things have been extraordinary. I mean, just imagine that 10 years ago, uh, no one took gay marriage very seriously, or 15 years ago. It's a huge change in world society. Those are all good changes. But that revolution is being led by cultural elites. It's not coming from below, and it's not democratic in the sense that no one gets to vote on this, right? But Hollywood, the press, the educational establishment sort of agrees that these new values need to be taught. That's good. The problem is this. If all your energies go into this cultural revolution, you are not paying attention mm -hmm. to real concrete power. The other thing is if all you talk about is these cultural things and how people are separated, even though those things are important, the picture that the public gets of you is as a party or a political group, liberals, only caring about that and those people. Mm -hmm and not caring about the nation as a whole or people who don't belong to those groups. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tragic choice to be made in terms of energy and in terms of rhetoric. Sie sagen an einer Stelle auch etwas, was ähm, wahrscheinlich wirklich viele ärgert, nämlich, ähm, das ist alles richtig, sich um diese Belange zu kümmern, zum Beispiel auch Toiletten fürs dritte Geschlecht, mm -hmm. alles wichtig, aber es sollte nicht die Priorität haben, die es im Moment hat. Das tut natürlich weh und es stellt sich die Frage, Sie sagen, vielleicht kann ich das auch noch erwähnen, weil mich das auch sehr beeindruckt hat, Sie sagen, es gibt in West Virginia Situationen, wo wir sehen müssen, jeder Zweite hat keine Arbeit und jeder Vierte ist abhängig von Opiaten. Mhm. Und das sind doch auch die Probleme und stattdessen sprechen wir nur über die Toiletten für das dritte Geschlecht. Gebe ich Sie so korrekt wieder und muss man sich denn entscheiden für die beiden mhm. Sorgen? Well, I, I, I do think that's true, and I do think one has to choose a little bit. Even more importantly, when I get this question from people involved in mm -hmm. identity politics, I need to convince them that if they don't pay attention to institutional politics, they cannot protect these groups in our states. Because in the American federal system, state law, the 50 states, state law determines many things. If you are in a Republican state, that will not pass legislation so transgender people have their own bathroom or something like that, no amount of activity in Washington is going to change that. I'll give you a very concrete example. In the state of Iowa a few weeks ago, the legislature decided to uh, make illegal uh, abortion from the moment that the heartbeat of the fetus could be heard. That's about six weeks. It's before most women know they're pregnant. The state is challenging the fact that we have a constitutional right to abortion in our country. Electing Hillary Clinton wouldn't have changed that. Congress wouldn't have changed that. The only way to change that is you must be able to go to Iowa, win elections in Iowa, and convince people who live in Iowa. And they are more than 80% white and almost 80% evangelical. So you must find a way to reach those people in order to protect your own people who live in that state. That's the point. Es ist ein Stück weit auch die gespaltene Gesellschaft, von der man immer wieder gehört hat, dass man eben nicht nur über die sozusagen unterdrückten Minoritäten sprechen sollte, sondern über diese vielen, vielen Leute, die einfach anders denken, aber sozusagen eigentlich zur Mehrheit gehören ein Stück weit. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to imply, and too many people think this, that uh, it's, a, it's a question of taking our eyes off of one set of groups mm -hmm. and focusing on another group. My point is that the Democrats need to not focus on groups at all, mm -hmm. but rather to articulate a vision of the kind of country that they want to build and on what kind of principles. The Reagan years, by which I mean from 1980 until Donald Trump, this era, um, the, the, the vision of the country was that less government, the better. Um, and if we have less government, the economy will do well and everyone will be better off. And uh, we all belong to our families and our churches, but there's no such thing as citizenship that really matters. Mm -hmm. Rather than combating that vision, the Democrats didn't. And now they need to articulate what kind of country they want to create so people in all of these groups can look at those principles mm -hmm. and say, that's me. Mm -hmm. 
Sie sind im Moment sehr viel unterwegs mit Ihrem Buch und mit dieser These. Sie kommen von Amsterdam, gehen danach jetzt von Berlin aus nach Paris, später nach Rom. Haben Sie den Eindruck, dass das Interesse an Ihrem Buch und an dieser These damit zu tun hat, dass wir in erster Linie verstehen möchten, was in den USA passiert? Oder sehen Sie Parallelen? Begegnen Ihnen ähnliche Phänomene in Europa? Well, it's very interesting. This book, it's the first book I've written about America, and I hadn't expected it to be translated anywhere. And it's being translated all over the world, not just in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, it's coming out in China, Korea, um, all these places. And what I'm discovering is that it's not because they want to learn something about the United States so much is that so many countries are experiencing anxiety about identity today. Who are we? What does the word we mean now? You know, if you say in German, wir schaffen das, who, who is wir? And in the face of globalization and massive movements of people and the Internet, people don't know what it is to belong to a society anymore, a locus for that. Mm -hmm. But it shows up in different ways in different countries. For example, if in France, they're very concerned about the Muslim population. Not immigrants so much, but the Muslim population that's there. In Spain, they're not worried about Islam. They aren't worried about immigrants so much. They're worried about Catalonia. And so country by country, I can go through and discover. I'm discovering. I'm getting an education seeing how these identity anxieties work out in different places, in Brazil, because it's a multiracial society and so on. Mm -hmm. Die Frage ist ja auch, warum kommt diese Frage nach dem Wir jetzt so sehr auf in so vielen Gesellschaften und ob das nicht etwas damit zu tun hat, dass die Globalisierung uns mehr und mehr eben anspricht als globale Bürger, was mm -hmm. wir aber irgendwie auch nie so richtig sein können, weil wir uns doch als lokal verhaftet empfinden. That's right. And you can't belong to the world uh, in that way. You know, the history of democracy, liberal democ modern democracy, is linked to the nation state. We have no examples of democracies that are not nation states. And why is that? Because the nation state is big enough to include a lot of people, but small enough so that people can identify with the nation state and with the government and They know that if they vote for something, then another party comes in. Europe right now um, is trying to do two things at once that are tearing apart the nation state. One is the construction of Europe from above. The other is not doing enough to control illegal immigration. And in all these European countries, people are wondering, what do we have to do to be heard about this? Uh, we, we pass a law in, in, in Germany, and the European Union decides we can't pass that mm -hmm. law. We want to control our borders. We end up not being able to control our borders. And so my view is that we need to focus again on the nation state, which one can do, I think, without nationalism, but focus on the principles that are there and the kind of social capital that already exists there. Mm -hmm. Damit stellen Sie sich natürlich sozusagen eine ganz andere Denklinie wie viele andere, die sagen, wir sollten den Nationalstaat abschaffen, wir sollten über noch offenere Grenzen sprechen. Aber das sind wahrscheinlich im Moment wirklich die beiden Pole, zwischen denen sich das ganze Denken im Moment ansiedelt. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, it's very important that Germans today take responsibility for the past. But they only can take responsibility for the past if they can define themselves as Germans, if they have a German identity. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get rid of the German identity and make all Germans just citizens of Europe, why should those people feel they're responsible for the experiences of Germany? Identity is important also to get people to be responsible for their histories. And those things go together. Those are not opposed. Mm -hmm. Dieses Wir, wie wir ein Wir bauen, das ist Ihre Grundfrage. Und Sie sagen auch, kein Gemeinwesen, kein Staat kann funktionieren ohne diese Idee eines Wirs. Und Sie sagen, dass die Identitätspolitik eigentlich für Sie ein Sinnbild hat, nämlich das Prisma. Da bricht das Licht ein, es zerfällt sozusagen in den Regenbogen. Was ein sehr, sehr schönes Bild ist, aber Sie sagen, es betont eigentlich immer das Prisma, die Diversität, die unterschiedlichen Farben, wir sind alle unterschiedliche Farben. Stattdessen sagen Sie, vergesst das Prisma oder nehmt es nur sekundär. In erster Linie brauchen wir wieder den Handschlag. 
Und meine Frage war dann, was könnten wir als Gegenstand nehmen? Was könnte stehen für den Handschlag? Und ich habe etwas mitgebracht und würde Sie gerne fragen, würde das hier passen? Die Verfassung der amerikanischen Staaten, wäre das der Handschlag? Ja. Well, that's a beginning, you know, and there's a German idea about that, of course, uh, when Jürgen Habermas spoke about uh, Verfassungspatriotismus, for example. But um, I don't know, but uh, I'm guessing that Habermas, though, would not be comfortable with a focus on borders and a sense that the only way you can have constitutional patriotism and a sense of commitment is by saying that we are we, and there are other people who are not we, and we want very good relations with them. But in order for us to be responsible and care about each other, we need a sense of not being other people, but being us. You know, um, the more immigration there is in certain European countries, you're finding that there is a declining support for the welfare state, because when people who are different come in, different assumptions, racist assumptions are being made. So we need trust. We need social trust, and that has to be thicker than just pointing to a document. We have mm -hmm. to define it by place and define it by the ideals that we're trying to uh, instantiate and create mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. Und wie genau schaffen wir das? Weil die Identitätspolitik hatte ja schon ein Stück weit auch dieses Ziel, nämlich den Menschen mm -hmm. das Gefühl zu geben, gehört zu sein. Also wenn man sich anschaut, wie groß der Rassismus in den USA zum Beispiel ist, ist ja völlig klar, dass es viele Menschen gibt, die sagen, ihr könnt noch lange davon sprechen, dass wir Amerika sind. Wir sind dauernd ausgeschlossen, wir sind dauernd nicht mitgemeint. Und mir fiel da auch noch Tanehishi Coates ein, der ein Buch geschrieben hat mit dem Titel «The First White President», mhm. natürlich an Trumps Adresse gerichtet. Und er hat ganz klar gesagt, naja, das war nicht das Problem der Identitätspolitik oder nicht das Resultat der Identitätspolitik, sondern das Stichwort ist «White Supremacy», also weiße Vorherrschaft. Das ist das, was die Leute wollten. Die Leute wollten eigentlich Rassismus pur von einem Präsidenten verkörpert. Wie gehen wir denn damit um? Wie bauen wir ein Wir, wenn eine so große Gruppe von Menschen sich dermaßen schlecht behandelt führt und tatsächlich ja auch oft mit gutem Grund? Ja, yeah, well, let me just say to begin with, I don't at all uh, share uh, Tanhesi Coates' view of our country and certainly of white America. My view is he needs to meet, meet more white Americans, frankly. Um, but, but your basic point is, is well taken. Let me describe how I think it would work. Imagine you have a black motorist who keeps being stopped by the police. We call that the crime of driving while black. And he's angry because the cops treat him differently. Then imagine a man who works in a town where there used to be a factory. He no longer has a job there. And uh, his wife and he are working part time, uh, can't support the, the health insurance for the kids. That guy's angry. How do we bring these people together? Mm -hmm. And the fact is, it's not a question of getting them to recognize each other's conditions, I think. What they have to see is that there's a vision of the country being offered by a political party and on certain values that if those values and principles were put into place would help each of them separately. So if, for example, our two fundamental principles are solidarity and equal protection under the law. Mm -hmm. Well, we would be able to tell the black motorists that you are being treated unequally under the law and we're going to change that. And we're able to talk, uh, say to the former factory worker that you won't be left alone. We have solidarity in this country and we'll help you and your family. That, that is enough. We don't need people The more we focus on our differences, the harder it is to get them focused on a different thing, which is the kind of country we want to build together. Ich finde das wahnsinnig interessant, was Sie sagen, weil ich den Eindruck habe, ich spüre so sehr, dass Sie unglaublich vertrauen auf, sagen wir, die Verfassung, auf den Rechtsstaat. Sie glauben, dass man damit die Menschen schützen kann und auch ein Wir bauen. Aber vorhin hatten Sie dieses Beispiel gebracht von Iowa mit der Abtreibungsdebatte mm -hmm. und haben mir eigentlich gesagt, wir haben die Verfassung, die sagt, Abtreibung ist legal innerhalb einer gewissen Frist. Mm -hmm. Und wen Sie eigentlich überzeugen müssen, sind die Evangelikalen. Also das zeigt doch, dass die 
Gesellschaft irgendwie in einer Art und Weise gestrickt ist, dass selbst wenn sie die Gesetze haben, gewisse Menschen doch nicht geschützt sind. Well, that's normal democratic politics, it seems to me, especially in the United States, which is a federal system. It's set up so that states can have different kinds of laws. Um, but the problem in Iowa, in a place like Iowa, is that Democrats aren't even present. It's entirely controlled by the Republican Party. Um, and so Republicans control two-thirds of the state legislatures, two-thirds of the governorships, half the states outright. If Republicans win two more states, they could call a constitutional convention and start rewriting it. That's serious. Do I have a lot of hope in this? Well, no. I, well, I think it's the only thing we can try, but I think there are even more barriers to it than you mentioned. It's not just identity politics. It's the Internet. It's the global economy. All these sorts of things, divorce, that are, that are splintering us into what Michel Webeck called elementary particles. All the more reason that we have to find the one thing we share in fact, not something we aspire to, something in fact. And what we share in fact is that we're all citizens. Nicht alle Menschen. Sie sagen, wir sind alle Bürger, aber wir teilen doch auch, dass wir alle Menschen sind. Das wäre sozusagen dann der globale Raum. Right, but there's no way of, of people attaching themselves to humanity and yeah. changing things because there is no political structure for that. Therefore, one must begin with the nation state. Genau, da sind wir wieder zurück bei dieser Frage, wo ist eigentlich das Ideal? Ist der ideale Raum der Nationalstaat oder der globale ähm, Zusammenhang? Mich hat sehr interessiert auch Ihre Analyse, wie es eigentlich zu diesen Zuständen gekommen ist in den USA. Mm. Da legen Sie nämlich, finde ich, eine sehr äh, interessante Überlegung vor. Sie sagen, es gab zwei Glaubenssysteme. Ich mm -hmm. versuche das kurz zusammenzufassen. Mm -hmm. Es gab einerseits ähm, erst einmal den New Deal, also die ganze Roosevelt Area, äh, 1930er Jahre bis ungefähr 1970er Jahre, mit der Bürgerrechtsbewegung und der Idee, Amerika fußt auf Respekt für alle, gleiche Aufstiegschancen und ein großes Maß an Solidarität. Danach kam das Glaubenssystem von Ronald Reagan mit einem Minimalstaat und sehr, sehr viel Individualismus, auch das, was wir Neoliberalismus nennen. Und Ihre Analyse geht so weit, dass Sie sagen, eigentlich haben die Demokraten da versagt, weil sie denen nichts entgegenzusetzen haben. Sie haben die ganze Idee von Roosevelt aufgegeben, weil sie den Individualismus auch wollten. Und dann haben sie sozusagen das ganze Paket eingekauft. Mhm. Warum ist das passiert? Warum konnte man diese Idee von Solidarität, was ein Stück weit ja auch immer die Gemeinschaft mitdenkt, nicht rüber retten und dann wirklich bei Clinton und Obama verdichten, sodass das jetzt die USA tragen würde? Well, there are a couple reasons why, um, um, at least three, I think, that, that there was a turn from the Roosevelt dispensation. One is that It had achieved pretty much what it had sought to achieve. And many of the things that the government was trying to do in the 1960s and 70s turned out to be uh, ineffective or even counterproductive. Every political epoch or vision has a, a half-life like uranium. You know, it only lasts so long. Mm -hmm. And what it also changed is that America had become a more individualistic country, in fact, in just so sociologically. Americans left cities and ethnic neighborhoods. White Americans moved to the suburbs. They had fewer children. Um, after the sexual revolution, uh, couples were sexually independent, led to more divorce, single mothers now. And so all this social glue that existed before, a lot of that has disappeared. And we can live this way more individualistically, but we need to find a way to then find some way to find what we do share. But what Reaganism did is that it wanted to reinforce that individualism politically and economically. And then identity politics comes along, and it wants to reinforce the individualism in terms of personal identity. So strangely, Reaganism and identity politics went hand in hand. Roosevelt had a political vision. Reagan had an anti-political vision. Warum? Das müssen Sie erklären. Warum ist das antipolitisch? Because uh, the government only causes us problems. We want to have a, uh, a minimal government. 
Uh, the ideal person is someone that never needs the government for anything. Um, politics is to be uh, is suspect and mm -hmm. dangerous. Um, and then identity politics is kind of pseudo political. People say they're very political, but they aren't focused on institutional politics. They're focused on themselves. And so what has what needs to happen now is not to re one never returns, as I say in the other mm -hmm. book, right? But we need to find a way, given the society we are, the fact that we're more individualistic, to find some way to discover what we actually still do share and build on that so that we can have a political vision again of the American project. Because America is a project. And how genau geschieht das? Sie sagen in Ihrem Buch ja auch, Citizens are made, not born. Also, Bürger müssen wir sozusagen herstellen oder machen oder befähigen. Wie machen wir das? Yeah, through education, to begin with. Um, you know, there, when I was in school, um, there was very serious civic education, and you learned American history, you learned about this book here, the Constitution. Not, uh, that doesn't go on much uh, in our schools today. And to the extent there is civic education, it is focused on becoming a social activist rather than on institutional power, which is what one needs. Because when the 60s generation left the universities, uh, left the streets, the new left collapsed, they became teachers in colleges and in schools, mm -hmm. and they brought this movement politics, identity politics idea there. So it's what our children grow up with now. And so it means beginning by educating. And, and you also need a leader to kind of embody that, and you can't predict that, you know? You can't mm -hmm. predict when someone like that is going to come along. But you need to be ready with the message so that once the person comes along, the two together can give an example to the nation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, if you go back to the 1950s and look at what um, American pundits, writers were saying about um, American children, is that they were unpolitical, the college they were unpolitical, only interested in getting ahead and making money, and John F. Kennedy comes along and, and um, announces that sentence that, 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 that you repeated, ask not what your country can do for you, but you can do for your country. Just that phrase electrified an entire generation. And that gives me hope that a moment may come along where something will catalyze and give young people a sense of, of not only what our project is, but um, what their duties are mm -hmm. to others and, and fill them with a sense of duty mm -hmm. towards others. Wenn wir zurückgehen zum Anfang des Gesprächs, dieser Satz, Make America Great Again, ich glaube, es ist sehr deutlich geworden, dass Sie ähm, Trumps ähm, Wahlspruch so nicht unterschreiben, aber vor allem auch seine Politik nicht unterschreiben. Mhm. Aber man könnte ja sagen, ein Stück dessen, was Sie beschreiben, möchte er ja auch. Er möchte auch ein starkes Amerika bauen. Inwiefern ist Ihre Vision anders wie die Vision von Donald Trump? Oh, well, that because it would be a country, uh, to begin with, that would be based not on fear and fear of the present, not on resentment, uh, not looking for scapegoats for our current situation, but rather would focus hopefully on the resources we have that bring the country together. You know, I see Trump as an interim figure. Uh, there are times, we, there, there are presidents in our history that are sort of between two of these big epochs. And I think he's, he, he is that. But he's a deeply reactionary personality. Because one of the things that all reactionaries share, and that is that the break that happens in history is the work of a small group of people. And it's always the same ones. It's always professors, journalists, uh, thinkers, artists, uh, school teachers, sometimes the Jews mm -hmm. in general. And um, Trump has that mentality. And because we have this uh, really quite radical conservative media, beginning with Fox News, for people who are in this, this bubble, it's possible to build up their resentment. And so they're, they're resentful against what they imagine to be a, a, a cabal of all these figures in the liberal elites in the two coasts. And they're being pushed by their fears and anger rather than by their hopes. Mm -hmm. 
Die ganze Frage, wie es eigentlich weitergeht in den USA, die wird ja im nächsten Winter auch noch einmal richtig interessant, wenn die Midterm Elections sind, am 6. November. Und für mich ist interessant, dass ich den Eindruck habe, noch vor ein paar Monaten hatte man den Eindruck, das wird nie und nimmer so sein, dass der Kongress kippen könnte, also dass Trump die Mehrheit verlieren könnte. Plötzlich sieht es doch wieder ein Stück weit anders aus, das wechselt immer mal wieder. Aber insgesamt muss man doch klarerweise sagen, wir haben, glaube ich, Donald Trump gehörig unterschätzt. Die meisten in Europa dachten, dass er eine komplette Witzfigur sei. Es gab ja. unglaublich viel Verballhornung in seiner Figur. Insgesamt muss man sagen, die Wirtschaft in den USA, die brummt. Ja, no, it, what, before one talks about the next elections, one always has to say that not only is Trump a very unpredictable figure, and he could do things from one day to the next that could win him or lose him votes. The other is that he's under serious investigation, and that could change things. The other is that, I think you were alluding to that, is that uh, we underestimated Trump because um, polling, doing polls of people, no longer seems to reflect the way they actually vote. That they tell an interviewer one thing and they do another. So those things have to be taken into account. Um, there are good signs and bad signs. Now, the good signs are that um, there are more Democratic candidates who want to run for office than the Democratic Party can handle. Organizations have grown up also to teach candidates how to run for office so that you say, I want to run for a state office. They send you some videos and they teach you how to raise money, how to spend money, how to deal with the press. And a lot of these people are veterans. I've talked to some of them. So you have Iraq and Afghan veterans who come back who are actually Democrats. And if you have Democrats like that, and so you see that it's, that it's not just, um, you know, hippies and professors, mm -hmm. uh, but it's people like this that want to build a more just nation together, that, that could really help us. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the, the downside is that it's entirely focused now, all of it is fun focused on beating Trump and Trumpism. And that lasts only as long as Trump's around. What isn't going on and what Democrats are allergic to is long-term thinking about their message, what they stand for. So at the time I wrote the book, uh, if you looked at the website of the Republican Party, there was a list of 11 principles that the Republicans stood for. Constitution was the first, immigration the last, very clear. Look at the Democratic website, no such thing, but at the bottom there are links to 17 different groups, and that's how you enter it. Republi uh, Democrats have to stop thinking of themselves as a group of groups, but to start to think long term about their message. Da sind wir wieder bei dieser Klientelpolitik, die Sie yeah. um, so kritisieren. Wagen Sie dennoch eine Prognose für den November? No, for all those reasons, it's very difficult um, uh, to say. It wouldn't surprise me, I would say, that we do very well in, um, in the November elections. But that's because we don't have to put up anyone against Trump. Mm -hmm. And that come 2020, Democrats are going to have to think very hard about what kind of person with what kind of politics is going to stand up against Trump if he ends up running again. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely uh, that they'll, they'll blow it, as we say. Um, you know, Steve Bannon gave an interview, uh, the inter an interview that got him fired, and part of it was about identity politics. And he said that as long as Democrats talk about race and identity, we'll beat them. This has been the thing we can always go back on. And the problem is that Democrats have been making breakfast for Steve Bannon every morning. And that has to stop. And we need to put forward a candidate with a larger vision that's not about groups that can compete with Trump. Mm -hmm. Etwas, was uns natürlich in Europa sehr beschäftigt und in der Schweiz auch diskutiert wird, ist die Frage, wie der Handelsstreit ausgehen wird. Und da hat ja Trump eine Marke gesetzt, könnte man jetzt neutral sagen, indem er eigentlich Handelszölle jetzt erheben will, gegen die gegen das WTO-Recht verstoßen. Interessant daran, mal ganz unabhängig davon, was da die rechtliche Situation ist und, und wie man das einschätzen mag, interessant daran fand ich, dass ich mich erinnert fühlte an ein Gespräch mit Sarah Wagenknecht, der Abgeordneten der Linken, die als Linke gesagt hat, 
Was wir wieder lernen müssen, ist einzusehen, dass die globale Wirtschaft eben diese, dieses lokale Zugehörigkeitsgefühl untergräbt. Und wir mhm. müssen wieder mehr eigentlich Protektionismus einführen. Ja. Und das ist das, was jetzt eigentlich Donald Trump tut. Mhm. Also etwas von dem auch, was Sie ja ein Stück weit vielleicht mitmeinen, wenn Sie sagen, wir müssen wieder den Nationalstaat stärken. Ja, yeah, no, exactly. You know, it, um, on, on trade policy, Donald Trump, <coughs> excuse me, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders agreed. And there's a left position for um, fighting globalization, and there's a right position. Das for, ist interessant. Bernie Sanders unterstützt ihn da. Oh ja, yeah, Bernie Sanders, that was one of the things he kept pushing, is we, mm -hmm. have to, we have to get rid of NAFTA, we have to get rid of a lot of our trade agreements and renegotiate them. They were completely in accord about that. The problem, the reason we have that, and one of the reasons we have that, is that the truth is no one knows what to do about globalization, economic globalization. And that's the first thing we have to admit. It's not as if someone on the right or on the left knows what to do or has a secret plan in his pocket. But politicians have to go out and win votes pretending they know what to do, right? And so when you're in that sort of situation, you can succeed by being an irresponsible demagogue about these things. And had Bernie Sanders been elected, many things would have been very different in our country, but our trade policy, I think, would have been the same. Wenn ich auf unser Gespräch zurückblicke, möchte ich noch einmal zurückkommen auf Wellbeck und die Idee der Elementarteilchen. Das ist ein Buch, was Sie immer wieder zitieren. Ich glaube, der Begriff gefällt Ihnen sehr, dass Sie sagen, ein Problem ist, dass wir ein Stück weit in der vielleicht kann man sagen, neoliberalen Welt, aber eben auch in der liberalen Welt, Elementarteilchen geworden sind und die Gesellschaft oder mehr die Gemeinschaft ein Stück weit aus dem Blick verloren haben. Was könnten Sie vielleicht noch so als philosophische Idee, als Gegenprogramm anbieten? Richard Rorty zum Beispiel mhm. taucht auch immer wieder auf, der amerikanische Philosoph, dessen kleines Büchlein «Achieving Our Country» mhm. jetzt auch nach der Wahl von Trump immer wieder zitiert worden ist und der liebäugelt ja, so ein bisschen mit, einer, mit einem neuen Roosevelt-Patriotismus. Können Sie dazu noch ein paar Dinge sagen? Was ist Ihre persönliche Vision? In welche Richtung soll sich denn Amerika entwickeln? Well, um, I, I think it was um, Adam Michnik um, in Poland after the, um, after the wall fell and Poland was independent, who said that during the communist period, Uh, they took what was an aquarium, a beautiful aquarium of Polish society, and made fish soup out of it. Our job is to take fish soup and make it into an aquarium again. <laughs> and what, which, of course, you can't do. And once you have this atomization, um, it, it's, it's a fantasy, I think, to think that you can recreate it, because conservatives are right about this. Social ties are not consciously created. They develop. They grow. And the most you can do is try not to uh, do things that will uh, ruin the ties that are already there. But I think we're going to live in a world with fewer social ties. I think that's going to be a fact. But that's why, and that's in society, in the Gemeinschaft, right? And even the Gesellschaft. But in politics, you have a chance to say that no matter how separated you are, Because we share things as citizens, we can have a project to make us better off around all these things without saying you have to share other communal things. You, you don't have to have dinner with each other. You don't have to have a lot of meetings. You know, Oscar Wilde said the problem with socialism is that it takes up too many evenings. We're not that kind of society anymore, right? So we need to adapt to the society we have but have a political vision of shared citizenship in nation states that gives us the best chance of pulling people together. Das ist eigentlich wieder ein bisschen die Idee des Verfassungspatriotismus von Habermas, den Sie erwähnt haben. Und viele sagen ja, das ist eine sehr kalte, technokratische Idee. Aber vielleicht teilen wir beide das, dass mich das eigentlich immer auch überzeugt hat, die, 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 die vernünftige Einsicht darin, dass man mit einem Handschlag oder mit einer Verfassung gemeinsam entscheiden kann, wie wollen wir zusammenleben und welche Aufstiegschancen sollen alle haben, welche Rechte sollen alle haben. 
das ist ja schon mal eigentlich nicht schlecht, sich darauf einigen zu können. Ja, yeah, but I don't think it's built on reason, as you suggested, or as Habermas did. We have to understand what kind of creatures we are. To begin with, there are a lot of unreasonable people, uh, there are a lot of busy people, there are a lot of uneducated people. How do you bring together a nation like that? Well, you do it symbolically. You do it with symbols. You do it with, um, with rhetoric. You do it by talking about your history. And even, and, and especially, you can't just focus on the bad things in your history. You have to be able to tell the good things that mm -hmm. people can be proud of that will pull them together. You have to involve the whole soul, so to speak, platonic soul, not just the rational part, but the rest of this. And I, I sense that there's a, that Habermas is suspicious of any of those sorts of appeals, and you have to live with borders. But, you know, when you see the flag, um, you, sh you know, you'd like people to feel something in the United States. And that's why there's such a controversy right now over um, sports stars who aren't standing up for the national anthem. We play the national anthem before all of our, our, our sporting events, and some of them are kneeling down to protest things about Black Lives Matter or something like that. But you want people to have an instinct that, yeah, that's us, mm -hmm. that's us doesn't matter what we look like, doesn't matter where our families come from, but not only do we, are we bound together by the Constitution that that flag represents, but we're also bound together by people who died for that flag and sacrifice every day to help each other in this country. Die Einsicht, das sind wir, braucht also vielleicht Vernunft, es braucht Emotionen, mm. es braucht Geschichten und vielleicht auch eine gemeinsame Kultur der Erinnerung. All of that. Ich danke Ihnen sehr für dieses Gespräch, Herr Thanks Lieber. for having me.